It is now 4 p.m. and it is June 21st, 2022. And this is the City Council work session, the City of Iowa City um, City Council work session. And our first, I hope everybody had an awesome and amazing weekend. Uh, lots of celebrations happening in our city, Juneteenth, as well as Pride. Um, we're going to start with the first item on our agenda, which is review of Parks and Recreation Facilities Master Plan. And we're going to invite our director, um, Julie Seidel Johnson. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Julie Seidel Johnson, Director of Parks and Recreation. I'm excited to be here today to talk about the Recreation Facilities and Program Master Plan. Uh, this is a process that's been going on for the last year and we're excited to have this checkpoint with you today to talk to you about where where we've been what we've listened what we've heard from the community and what some of the big picture recommendations are um, so a couple things about today first of all remember these are big picture concepts that we're going to talk about today big picture long term and kind of big price tags along the way just like when you heard from the senior um, center plan a few months ago a lot of our ideas that you're going to see in this master plan come with pretty hefty long-term price tags. Um, we'll talk towards the end about what's in the budget right now and what can be accomplished with what's that, what's there. But this is longer term, 10 or 15 years. So we'll also talk about that. We're hoping to get some guidance as we go through some of the short-term planning as well, though. We have um, on and off, we have some renovations and maintenance things that happen in our buildings. And this will help, this plan will help guide us to how much investment we make in the current facilities uh, versus waiting for something new that may come down the road. Um, this, what you're going to see in this presentation has been available to the public since May 21st. It was at the Public Works Open House. It was online. There's been two public um, open houses with their consultants from Barry Dunn, as well as a presentation of the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. So this has been the phase two part of the plan, the recommendations, and we've given the public a chance to give us feedback on those recommendations. You'll hear about that feedback as we go through, and I know that you've gotten some letters and comments from the public public as well. We will be addressing that, um, but realize the phase two input or the phase two recommendations is based on all the information that has been gathered over the last year. So that includes a robust outreach effort to not only our current users, but also into areas of the community that we know weren't accessing our community or our services. So we went out to the parks, we went out to the neighborhoods to gather additional feedback to find out what the barriers were to using our facilities. I included an online component. People have asked about how accurate this is since we've been in the middle of a pandemic. And I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that because this has been a weird time for the last two years. Uh, but we have had a very good success with an online format of having public input through the online format. We got outside whenever we could in the parks and got feedback outdoors in the parks. We've had it at our community centers. And we did a statistically valid survey, which you'll hear about. We're going to walk through how we got from those to the recommendations today, that public input with an equity focus, then actual conditions and uses of our current facilities. And there were some big surprises to us. I think we all knew that the age and condition of City Park Pool is what it is. You know, 72 years old, we know that that was going to be an issue. Staff was actually very surprised about the numbers we saw for Robert A. Lee, and we'll talk about that more, especially the indoor pool at Robert A. Lee. And then current realities of operations. That has changed in the last couple of years. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about um, the updated express community needs. And once again, from all of the community members, um, you find that some of the phase two input was very focused on a few user groups um, and that we're glad that we heard from them. We know they're important users of our facilities, but we did more. We got more outreach too from groups that aren't there as well. So before I turn it over to the consultants, I'm going to go real quickly through some of the common things that I've heard from the community in this phase two feedback. And you've probably heard some of these things too, so I want to give you this information up front. So we heard from several people that they felt that there wasn't a chance for public input on this plan. That's one of the things we're going to walk through and show you how much feedback and how that was solicited through phase one and phase two. So there was actually a very robust outreach through a number of channels, a number of different languages, a number of different locations. Um, there's a common, 
question about why are we recommending closing Robert A. Lee Rec Center. That is not a recommendation in this plan at this point. The rec center itself is not recommended to close. It is saying there may be some things we want to do differently in decommissioning the indoor pool at Robert A. Lee, but the rec center itself has never been a part of that recommendation. Um, people wanted to know why they weren't asked about closing the pool during the phase one input. Uh, honestly, because that wasn't a recommendation or even a thought when we started this process a year ago. It's been an outcome of the facility um, assessments of the input that we've received from the public and the actual use numbers we've been seeing in that facility. So it wasn't asked early on in the plan because we didn't know until we got through phase one that it seemed to make sense as a re recommendation. I love this one. <laughs> what about the bomb shelter at Robert A. Lee? Um, indeed, here's what we know. So the building was built in around 1963, and it was part of the civil defense program for the state that made it a nuclear fallout shelter. How do we know that? We actually took the signs down in 2017. They were still on the outside of the building at that point. Um, we also know that from when we've done minor renovations of the restrooms in anything on that main level. The concrete is extra reinforced and extra thick, so it follows that kind of that main corridor down through the lower level was probably built as a nuclear fallout shelter for that reason. There's been concerns that we said there was a bomb shelter under the pool. I don't think, I'm not sure if that was the actual wording used, but there's no space under the pool. It's that the entire building was built with that as one of its contexts for when it was built. Um, some questions about why close the pool when it's such an important part of the downtown atmosphere. We agree, we want Robert A. Lee to be a really important part of the downtown atmosphere and used by families and young adults. We're just not seeing that use in the swimming pool. And so we're saying that maybe the space used by the swimming pool could be used for something else that more appropriately meets or it has an even bigger draw for young people, adults, families. And we've had all kinds of suggestions for that, but that would be a further phase down the line to go into if the pool went away, what could it be? But there's lots of suggestions out there, I can tell you that. Um, and then finally, there's been a lot of comments back and forth about specifics of some of the, the concept designs that we showed, uh, both for City Park Pool and for Mercer Expansion. Just want to remind everyone those are concept designs. We gave people something to react to. Each one of those projects, if they were to move forward, would go through their own separate design phase with a whole other round of public input. So the number of lap lanes, the type of locker rooms, the depth of the water, the price tag for all these. None of that has been etched in stone. We were just giving people something to react to based on the feedback that we received in phase one. And the overall feedback in phase one was wanting more adult wellness, more adult aquatics, so lap swimming, aqua fitness, um, the walking track idea at Mercer was huge. And then a, a realization that we have limited resources and how do we prioritize those. So I'm gonna let our consultants, uh, Daniel Wilson and Elsa Fisher come up. They're gonna walk you through part of the process. Brad Barker will take you through our athletic fields and then I'll take you through the facility information as we go through. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having us today. We're excited to share with you all of what the firm Barry Dunn has done with your staff team and to help try to develop this plan for the future of your recreation facilities and programs. And so today, just a quick agenda, we want to introduce you to the process and that, thank you for the, the lights being dimmed, appreciate that. We wanna walk you through what process we have undergone to date. We want to make sure we convey what community engagement feedback uh, process in, entailed and also the results of that. We will share a little bit about the recreation programs assessment, then the outdoor facilities assessment, the indoor facility assessment, and then what next steps are involved in this process. 
we wanted to share with you that Barry Dunn has had a full team of experts as in, engaged in this process to help develop this plan. We have had architects, landscape architects, aquatic engineers, and statistically valid survey experts all a part of this process. And the goal was to create a roadmap for future recreation programs, aquatic facilities, indoor recreation space, and outdoor athletic and specialty use areas. So that's what we're charged with, and that's what we wanna share with you today. So we underwent a four-phase process, and you'll see that the last phase, the planning part, is where we are right now. I would say we're at the very beginning stages of that. We've started to develop that plan. But before that, we have also undergone an entire engagement phase of the process. We've done a lot of assessment work and analysis work, some visioning, and then now where we are in the planning stages. Some of the influencing factors that we want to share with you that were at the very top of, of, of our minds when we started this plan with your staff and with your community, and at the very top of that list is equity. It was made very clear to us from the beginning, and we really, really latched onto this project. And because of that extra effort and intention on equity through the entire process and plan, access was also critically important. The city already has a very strong approach to climate change, and we want to respect and honor that. There is also nationwide and really worldwide a worker shortage. I want to remember that as we continue to think about things like innovation, operational facilities, and also pre-pandemic, there was a lifeguard shortage in our industry before any, any of this even came to be a few years ago. And as a result of the pandemic, what we've seen nationwide is a desire for larger indoor spaces and better ventilation within those indoor spaces. So with that, we want to share next the community engagement phase and results with you. And Elsa Fisher is here to talk with you about that part. Thanks, Danny. Hi, everybody. Um, so community engagement, as Danny mentioned, um, big DEI focus from the very, very start. And the first document that you're looking at on your screen is a, an insert that went out in a utility bill um, to, to kick off the process. So all the, the dates that are listed on this card were opportunities where residents could interact with uh, department staff. There was a list of questions, there were surveys, there were many ways that residents could share their thoughts about the future of parks and recreation, specifically recreation programming and facilities in Iowa City. So that insert was the start of the process. So on this slide, as uh, Julie mentioned, there were two separate phases of input. The first, at the beginning of the process, included focus groups. Danny and I did 10 focus groups with a variety of different people throughout the community. Uh, community. Um, as I mentioned, staff did the pop-up events. There were 13 of those that Brad and his staff led. And then you had a statistically valid survey. So ETC Institute was part of the project team. All they do are community surveys. So they did a statistically valid survey for Iowa City, and there were 450 responses uh, to that survey. So that, that was a, a very successful um, endeavor. And then the same survey was also available online. So people who didn't get it in the mail but wanted to participate had the opportunity to, to fill out the same survey. And they were tabulated separately, but when we did our analysis, we looked at the results of the statistically valid and the results of the other. And ironically, the results were very, very similar. Um, and then uh, the, the last big part of engagement, we had a, um, an online tool uh, called Social, uh, Social Pinpoint. And this was an opportunity for people to weigh in from home. So they could fill out a survey. There were two different surveys. One was designed for users, people who participate in programs, go to your parks, go to your facilities. And then there was a survey for people who, non-users, why don't they come? What are the barriers? So two different surveys. There was also an ideas wall and, and a forum and, and questions about city park pool. So many opportunities online for people to participate. And the, the notion of social pinpoint is, is that I go online, I fill out 
my thoughts, and I look and see how other people feel, and I can comment on other people's thoughts, give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, so it becomes uh, an engaged process, but virtual. Um, so that was the, the first phase of the engagement. And then, as Julie mentioned, after we did all of our analysis, then we had an opportunity for people to engage again. So we brought things back and said, okay, this is what we heard, now here's some, some designs, take a look. So for the, the second phase, there was the open house, as Julie mentioned, the Parks and Rec Commission meeting, there were two open houses. And then we also put um, the designs up on the social pinpoint site so people could take a look, fill out a survey, say what they liked, didn't like, and we asked specific questions about, you know, does this meet community need, getting back to the DEI component. And that was, um, and then there were many people who reached out with emails to staff, sharing their thoughts about the designs and, and the planning going forward. So ETC, um, they have what they have called uh, the priority investment rating. And what they do is they combine programs and facilities that people have an interest for with unmet need. So interest and unmet need combined. So this slide shows you the priority investment rating for four different categories. The first one being recreation center amenities. Top, and, top of everyone's list is an indoor track. People in this community really want an indoor track, and that's not uncommon across the country. Um, there's also interest in the weight room. There were many comments on the social pinpoint site in the first round of engagement that people really missed the um, weight room that was removed from Mercer several years ago. Um, so that was, it came up as a high priority investment. And then fitness room and then meditation and yoga studio were also in the top four. And then moving across the page, outdoor pool amenities. The top one is shade. The second was lazy river which you won't see in the plan, and I'll, uh, Julie will explain why. Uh, deck chairs, very important, and lap lanes. We know that lap swimming is very, very important in uh, Iowa City. From a recreation programming standpoint, the top item was adult fitness and wellness programs, which obviously is in, in line with the indoor walking and jogging track. Nature programs are also of importance. The farmer's market is a very beloved program in Iowa City. People love it, um, and they, they, they want to keep it, and um, it continues to be really popular. And then adult art classes rounded out the top four. In regard to pool programming, water fitness classes and water aerobics was the top item. Uh, lap swimming, again, very, very important in Iowa City. Senior aquatic programs, and then swim lesson programs. So those are the top priority investment investments based on community interest combined with unmet need. So city park pool, um, obviously hot topic in Iowa City. Are you going to, after 72 years, are you gonna renovate it and keep it as is, or are you going to renovate it with a new design? And the top line on this slide, the statistically valid survey, 67% desire a renovation with a new layout. And then at the bottom, the average percentage, that is a combination of all of the different engagements. So the events, the online, the focus groups, over 55% um, desire a new pool layout. So pretty resounding that people would like to see some change. Now we heard over and over and over again that people don't want a water park, but people do want some new amenities at that facility. So there were several high-level um, engagement themes. The first one, City Park Pool, it's time for repair, um, and despite many, many different ideas, pretty clear that people want a new layout. From uh, fitness and wellness unmet needs, indoor track and programs for adults, very important. There's a high value on aquatics in Iowa City. Obviously, you have three pools, lots of people involved in swimming. So aqua fitness, lap lanes, and instruction are all really important. Special interest user group opinions. We heard from a lot of pickleball players in the first uh, social pinpoint survey. Regardless of what the question was, the answer was often pickleball, <laughs> even if the question related to something else. So pickleball is a big deal in Iowa City, and and that user group came out loud and uh, loud and clear. Same thing with aqua, uh, aqua fitness and lap swimming. Lots of lap swimmers um, expressed their opinions about uh, the designs. 
Farmer's Market, I've already mentioned that. People love that event. Future program ideas, a, a comprehensive list was generated and that'll be reviewed in a couple of minutes. And then we also learned about people's preferences for your outdoor athletic field complexes and what people would like to see moving forward with your outdoor, uh, outdoor complexes. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Danny so that she can review the information from the recreation assessment. Okay, thank you so much. And so one of the questions we get often is, well, what is a recreation assessment? What do you do when you assess programs? So really what we do is we help the department look at what they're doing really well. We look at opportunities to strengthen what they've been doing. Where could some growth occur? We also help them look at some performance measures and then alignment with community need. We look at your core programs that have been offered to date and the list on the left demonstrates what those key program areas have been so far. And then we look at the most recent full year of data. So in this case, it's 2019 is really when we can see what a historically traditional year would look like and how that breaks out. So really, really great percentage of your programming has been in aquatics. That is often because there are so many different sections of aquatics offered at a bunch of different levels. Second to that is youth sports, STEAM programming, et cetera, as you move around the pie chart. So it helps us look at, of those 5,600 programs, where do those line up? And then we also look at enrollment. We look at your participation. So one ultimate goal is to continuously try to meet the needs and interests of your community through recreation programming. And we use enrollment to kind of gauge that. How many people are interested, actually enroll and commit to participating with you. So our ultimate goal along the way is to always help you plan ahead to keep residents interested in the newest sometimes the latest and greatest. So you'll see that from an enrollment perspective, you still have a very heavy participation in aquatics, youth sports, and then inclusive and adaptive recreation, really impressive participation numbers from those different areas. We can also break those down by season. That's what you see on the bottom right-hand side is by season across the year how it shakes out and when people participate. The nice thing is, in other communities, aquatics, you might have a varied, a lot of people participating in the summer and not as many in the other months. You've got a nice round participation rate there and also youth sports. Consistently every season, you've got youth sports being offered and, by the way, uh, enrolled in to youth sports. The other question we have when we think about equity is, well, where, what parts of the community are we reaching? And one of the concerns was the east versus west. You know, we have the river dividing the community. Are we reaching the folks that live on the west side of town? Are they participating with us? And so when we do this analysis and you see the heat map in front of you, when you look at the blue areas, that's where people are not participating, the households in which they're not really as uh, participatory as, as you get more densely populated areas that have a lot of participation in your programs, that's where you move to those red colors into the yellow. The yellow program areas mean you have a lot of folks coming from that part of town. Actually, much to our surprise, you're meeting the needs of the folks on the west side of town really well. Now, we are speaking in generalities, but when you look at total population and, and overlay this heat map with where your population resides, we're actually doing a really great job. As we mentioned earlier, this particular assessment really tried to focus on DEI outcomes. And not only did the staff look inside and internally as to, well, how are our programs doing? And, and we won't get into the details of all those specific analyses, but the staff really wanted to look at the different programs areas and say, how are we meeting the needs from an equitable, diverse, and inclusive perspective? And they also looked how, into how they are operating. How do people register for programs? And is that as inclusive as it could be? So we've got a spectrum of opportunity for growth for the staff, and I commend them for digging deep because not a lot of communities across the nation are actually undergoing this level of DEI assessment. So kudos to your staff for committing to and following through on that. 
What we then do is we take what we learn from the analysis of all of the programs and we start to connect what we're learning to what the community is saying. So what we found is from an adult fitness and wellness perspective, there is a growth opportunity there. There are a lot of households that asked for more. Over 10,000, almost 11,000 asked for more adult fitness and wellness opportunities. And when we did that pie chart and looked at the percentage of the program menu in 2019, it was actually very small. So there's an opportunity for growth there. Inclusive and adaptive recreation programming is doing really well and is very strong. So we wanna encourage the continued growth of that because we still see evidence that there is continued need and more need. So there's opportunity there. From an aquatic programming perspective, you, the city is meeting the needs of a lot of participants. We would say that the, from a high priority of the pool programs, a lot of the folks wanted more aquatic exercise. So that's why you'll see in the design processes how can we try to incorporate more for the aquatic exercise folks and also swim lessons continues to be an important um, initiative on the behalf of the department and the city and so we'll, we'll have Julie review some opportunities for more growth of swim lessons in a little bit. And finally, from a youth sports perspective, what we see is an opportunity to refine, or redefine rather, what youth sports looks like in the city. So yes, there are the traditional sports and those needs seem to be being met. There's an opportunity to expand what that definition of sports for youth means beyond the traditional three. So when we think about the key programming opportunities in identifying fitness and wellness, adult programming, inclusive and adaptive programming, aquatic exercise, teens and culture, we then look at the supporting facility spaces. Do you have the facility space to be able to support the growth of these different areas? So we see the opportunity to make sure that you have fitness and wellness spaces like the indoor walking and jogging track, weight room, and fitness room. Also, what sort of indoor space can support continued uh, opportunity for more programs for folks that need a, a maybe adaptive equipment or some sensory space? The warm water pool can help support the aquatic needs. Multi-purpose use, multi-function spaces will serve over 65% of the categories, a uh, program categories listed in the surveys, the results. So the more, uh, more multi-purpose room space you have available, the, the more the staff can program and meet the needs that were identified through this process. And finally, we have an opportunity to decentralize some of your indoor spaces geographically and spread them out through the community to offer indoor space closer to people's homes. So to recap, when we learned what these program growth opportunity areas were, these categories, this is where in phase two, the image you see on the right might look familiar. This is what was posted at the open houses and also online to say, hey, Give us your ideas on what specific program titles you would like to see within these categories. And we now have a whole list of, of uh, program ideas for the staff to be able to um, pull from and offer specific programs in these categories. You also might remember seeing this, this concept drawing. It's, the idea here is it's a satellite facility so that You've got two very centralized, large recreation centers now, but how do you continue to meet the needs of folks on the north side of town, the south side of town, east, and then west? As we continue to describe the other areas of the plans, you'll start to see that, well, you're already planning to do something with City Park Pool. When you do that, could the bathhouse also have an indoor program room as a part of that design process built into that change. And then now you have a program space on the north side of town. 
opposite of that, we heard a lot about the South District. How can we offer more opportunities on the South side of town? Something like this, perhaps in Weatherby Park, perhaps somewhere else, could offer local neighborhood children a place to go for summer camp, for example. Eastside Sports Complex, has in its master plan space for an indoor facility that is not yet defined. But now that we see that multi-purpose space could be of real value to decentralize and have space throughout the community, that could be an east side location. And then finally, the west side, as growth continues, as the city continues to explore possible acquisition on that side of town, keeping in mind, how can we continue to meet the indoor space needs on the west side? Perhaps it is a satellite facility and not a great big, another recreation center. And so with that, speaking of our spaces, Brad is going to talk about our outdoor facility assessment. Welcome. Hello, everybody. So I wanna talk a little bit about our outdoor recreational facilities. A lot of times when you think about recreation, you think about recreation centers, you think about pools. But in our parks, we've got our outdoor uh, recreational amenities and fields that are very important as the city has shown that uh, there's a strong interest in recreational opportunities outdoors for people as well through sports and other matters. Um, so with this assessment, with this project, we looked at um, our current athletic facilities, which we have four primary ones that we looked at, and then one uh, that Danny just alluded to, the East Side Sports Concept, or East Side Sports Complex, which is more conceptual in nature at this point. Um, so to review those briefly, I wanted to talk about the city park ball fields, which is one of the amenities that we have. So that's tied in with the lower city park master plan. And we've been doing some work with that, with that facility over the last few years. Um, we've been doing some upgrading with fencing, uh, shifting fields to kind of help with um, flood prevention, uh, some dugouts, some signage, some long-term upgrades that we'd like to do with that amenity is upgrade the lights, do continued field improvements, and uh, do some work on the pickleball and tennis courts as well. Uh, Napoleon Fields, we do have some money in the CIP for some improvements with some of those fields in the future. Uh, we've recently gotten some additional amenities out there like the new playground, so we are doing some improvements to that area as well. And then the kicker soccer field, uh, recent renovations have been uh, converting the uh, ball fields that were out there into additional soccer fields. Uh, do keep in mind that any uh, long-term plans with that, we are a part of the, uh, the wastewater treatment space that's out there. And so any long-term planning that would go out there would, would need to include a, a master plan. Uh, and then that brings us to Mercer Park. Uh, so we did a, a master plan with Mercer Park back in 2020, and at that time we were working with um, City High. They've indicated that they have an interest in having their ball field out there. They currently have a 28E agreement with the city to use field number one. Um, and we also have, have learned through the course of the last couple years that the pickleball courts and the tennis courts out there also need some work as well. There's some foundational issues, and so that would be something that would be included with a, a master plan project as well. The master plan that was created would include a pavilion area, uh, new LED lighting, field improvements, fencing, and shade. And we do have some funding, I believe, in the FY23 capital improvement project budget. Um, that would include costs to cover some of the projects that we would need to do some improvements there, but might need some additional funding in years ahead. And then that leads us to the Eastside Sports Complex, which is more conceptual in nature. Uh, that is currently undeveloped, 79 acre space for future developments, potentially as a specialty park. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at through a master plan that was developed about six years ago uh, was developing that into a sports complex that would potentially uh, be a site for both local sports groups and potentially regional uh, groups to come and utilize that as a tournament location. Uh, we did uh, have the um, Think Iowa City group did an economic impact analysis to see what the impacts would be for that study, uh, for that 
for that complex over the years. And they did indicate that it was more, it would be a great addition to the community for, um, for additional ball fields, additional access. But as far as drawing regional groups, it probably would not have as much impact as initially thought. Is and that, that because th of the amount of ball fields? Correct, because there, there wouldn't be enough ball fields to, to draw the teams in from outside the state and, and have the economic impact that was originally thought. Just with the space of the land that's out there would have to be something that's larger than that. Um, and that, that project was a, uh, with the, the East Side Sports Complex Master Plan, that was gonna be a phase development. So the first phase was around 17 million. This is in 2019 dollars. And then, um, cause we, we kind of reviewed that master plan in 2019 after its initial conception a few years prior. So 17 million for, and that's basically all your outdoor spaces. And then there would be potentially a second phase that would include an indoor sports area that could house groups throughout the course of the year. And that brought it up to about 30, 30 plus uh, in, in the million department. So. And then, so with our, so with our, um, our project that we had, uh, we did this in phases. So as, as they alluded to earlier, we had two different phases with our community engagement plan. Our first engagement plan, we did a lot of different concepts with asking people what they thought, um, what they wanted with our outdoor facilities moving into the future. And what they indicated was that they were very interested in investing dollars into providing recreational opportunities outdoors for people to participate in. So people were interested in investing dollars into our fields um, and potentially into bringing in sports groups and tournaments um, into our community as well. But they also indicated that they would need additional information at that time. So. What we did moving into the second phase was figuring out how to prioritize that uh, with the facilities that we currently have and then the conceptual east side sports complex. And what they indicated that Mercer Park was their primary interest, east side sports was the second, and then it moved on down the list. So our recommendation moving forward, given that we have a strong interest from uh, the community for Mercer Park improvements, we do have some funding that's currently in the capital improvement project plan. City High has indicated that they wanna to continue to make that a home for their ball fields. And we'd like to do the same with our sports affiliate groups and the other sports organizations in the community. And that uh, the pickleball and tennis courts is a very, pickleball is a very fast growing sport. And they've uh, come out strong with this um, master plan project indicating that they'd like to see improvements made out to there as well. So that would be our recommendation is to continue to invest in the Mercer Park as kind of the top tier and then moving down that list. Would the improvements to the fields at Mercer Park, would that include expanding and creating more baseball fields? That's an awful lot of usage that's being described. No, the, the master plan doesn't include expansion of the fields at Mercer Park. Potentially it would, potentially would increase the, the, the tennis and pickleball space, but the foundation is, has, we've indicated that the, the foundation's rather poor there, and we would actually need to probably redo the courts altogether. Thank you. Hi, it's me again. Just want to make sure we explain Hitchcock Design Group's work. They went through a whole exercise of assessing each one of these sports fields sites and used a site condition rating on a number of different facets and then came up with a series of recommendations per facility and you're never gonna read them all here. <laughs> We're not gonna go through each one of those recommendations. Wanted to just express that we had a, that's one of our experts on the team that went through the assessment process, leading us to ask the community about these outdoor facility priorities. Just wanted to make sure I explain Hitchcock Design Group's work and pass it back to Julie. All right, 
right, so now let's talk about indoor facilities. This is probably the most talked about part of the recommendations we've had in the last month. Um, as you know, we looked at both of the rec centers, the indoor pool and indoor pools and city park pool. So I'm gonna walk you through the findings of those starting with Mercer Aquatic Center and Scanlon Gymnasium. Realize that the assessments were done nearly a year ago. So some of the smaller things that we show in this that needing to be done have actually already been addressed by staff. And it, so it has everything from small things up through larger things. But the summary on Mercer Aquatic Center is it's in pretty good shape. Um, there are some maintenance needs to it. We know that the roof is coming due for replacement, but that, that's expected with that, that uh, age of building. Um, a number of the small things here, the cracked tiles, the rusted things, those have been addressed as part of the recent dehumidification and HVAC project that's been happening. So a lot of the smaller things on here have been addressed. Um, but the, the uh, pool, uh, architect and the operations person went through the facility with our staff, um, evaluated everything on age and condition, and as I said, they found that Mercer is actually in pretty good shape. Um, we've invested in it quite a bit over the last few years. It's also a younger facility that has benefited from the 2080 agreement with the school district. Um, the one recommendation is that the waiting pool be shut down. I don't even know if most people know there is a waiting pool outside of Mercer. It gets a lot of used by ducks um, and occasionally people, but that is one thing that it's recommending. Now, when you take the condition of Mercer, the other thing they looked at is how do we meet some of the needs expressed in the phase one through facility changes. And several of those are recommended for here at Mercer. So in the Mercer pool, what the recommendation would be is to add a warm water, medium to shallow depth pool, primarily for aqua fitness and swim lessons. As you remember, those were two of the higher demand things in the survey, followed closely by lap swimming. And by moving those things out of the regular pool into their own pool, probably have some effect on the number availability of lap swimming as well. The other really neat part about this particular plan is that it shows, we heard how much they, people like the hot tub, and in fact, they had asked if we should put one at Robert A. Lee as well. But this one adds a new hot tub that actually has a ramp entrance. So if you are someone who has mobility concerns, this greatly increases your ability to use our pool. That's something you'll see in this plan and then also City Park Pool is one of the things we heard over and over leading up to the, the master plan and during the plan was needing increased accessibility to the pool, increased ways, easier ways to get into the pool water, to enter and exit, to get across the pool deck. So those are largely addressed by a number of the recommendations in this plan. The other thing that is included here is the blocked out space for the locker rooms and is called general neutral toilet shower changing room. We don't know exactly what that means and there's been some apprehension from the public about that of what does it mean. We're asking project architects to do something they haven't necessarily done before in a facility and figuring out how we can have both um, single gender restrooms and locker rooms, but also um, neutral areas so that you don't have to decide male or female when you come into the pool. We heard this a lot from parents and kids. Um, we actually have a number of lifeguards that this affects and they would really like to see some neutral, gender neutral spaces for changing. So you see that in there. Um, this brings about some operational efficiencies. As we'll talk later, this goes along with potentially decommissioning Robert A. Lee Pool. What that does is moves all of our indoor lifeguards to one location, but more importantly, our swimming pool maintenance staff, supervision staff, everything else that goes into running the two pools, there'd be some real efficiencies there with that. The other part of Mercer shows an expansion on the other half of the Mercer, the Scanlon Gym area, adding a third gym and a walking track. Now, this has been a big point of debate through the communities we've shown this. How in the world are you gonna do two walking lanes around the gym? Don't know exactly yet. Could be elevated, could be at the level of the, of the gym space, could be plexiglass between. There's a lot of different ways to accomplish it. Think of it as a concept right now, though. We had a lot of input asking for indoor walking space. This shows that it could be done on the site. 
exactly how is still to be still to be determined. Um, and then reconfiguring the rest of the indoor meeting room spaces there into new fitness slash general multi-purpose room space. Do you want me to keep going? You want to ask questions about that before I move on? What's the yellow piece in there that sort of? That's just the corridor. Okay, sorry. Yeah, better circulation through the building, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna move on to Robert A. Lee. This, as I mentioned earlier, was one of our surprises as we went through the phase one analysis. Um, as a staff, I think you know our administrative offices are in this building, so low use of the pool was not a surprise to us. We, we can see the pool <laughs> throughout the day every day and know that it's not uncommon to have zero, one, or two lap swimmers for a greater portion of the day. Um, but the surprising part was the condition of underground pipes, the condition of the filters, the pumps, pretty much everything that makes the pool run besides the water. Um, you couple that with the ongoing concerns we've heard from the public of inferior locker rooms or unsuitable locker rooms that really need updated, um, issues with parking, issues with access into the building, some ADA concerns. Big picture of that leads us to say that maybe this isn't the best location for a swimming pool and the current facility probably isn't the best suited for the emerging needs that we're hearing from the community. Does it serve a certain number of lap swimmers? Yes. Does it serve deep water aqua fitness, the six or eight members of that group? Yes, it does. But we did actual counts during the month of May. And from our security cameras, you can see there was rarely more than two swimmers in the water at any one time. So um, the actual use versus maybe what you've been hearing about the perceived use is very different. And as a Parks and Rec director, I hate to ever say we should close down a facility, but I gotta tell you, this one has such little use that I'm not, I'm not sure that it's worth the investments. And we'll do whichever, because we love to see people swim. We know it's an important part of our community. This plan would say, though, that the amount of investment that it's going to take to bring this up to be the facility we need it to be would probably be better served in a different location and this space repurposed to something else. The biggest problem we have in this building is the underground piping and the condition of the cast iron pipes. Um, it's causing circulation problems. They're collapsing in different places. And every time we call a plumber in, <laughs> we have to cross our fingers because we don't know if it's gonna be a one hour or a 10 day close. It's been that difficult to keep things in repair. Um, we currently are working on the air conditioning for just two of the rooms. That has a $41,000 price tag. So everything in this building is getting more and more expensive. And we wanna make sure you wanna keep investing in those things specifically for the swimming pool versus using it towards other um, uses in the community. The conclusion of the study was that with it being 58 years old, it's gonna take continual repairs. We have some money in the budget coming up for this, but I'm not sure it'll be enough based on what we just paid for the Mercer repairs. They could be done to extend the facility operations, but just like City Park Pool, we're getting to that kind of end stage where you're either gonna need a major renovation or a different use. And the estimated cost for just the needed repairs, so this is just the filtration system, the pump system, the wading pool circulation, that's about four and a half to five million dollars right now is what they're estimating. Was there an estimate of what it would cost to do a reno? Not to do a full reno, not yet, no. We could, we could look into that too. Um, the addition at Mercer, I forgot to mention, was about nine million. So that would be more to do a new facility, um, but that. And you couple that, as I said, with the low use that we've seen, it becomes difficult for staff to recommend either that we would continue to invest in this, in this particular pool. Okay, now move on to City Park Pool. I thought this would be the most controversial part of the plan. <laughs> and actually, as, as mentioned earlier, I think we've all seen the condition. You've heard about the condition. Of, it's probably one of the oldest and largest outdoor swimming pools still operating in the state of Iowa, if not in the region. It loses a considerable amount of water. It takes pretty Herculean efforts every spring to get it reopened. I mean, we are caulking and, and um, 
painting and, and doing all kinds of remedial tasks, just trying to keep it to hold water so we can be operational for the whole year. The bathhouse is in okay condition, but needs quite a bit of repairs. And most importantly, we've got some confined space issues in the filtration room that's been there a long time. It's a safety issue, and it's probably time to address that as well. So when we put this out to the public after we, well, I should say, first of all, the recommendation is that 72 years old, could you line it and get a few more years out of it? Yeah, we could do that, but that's a fairly expensive fix, and it's definitely not long-term. Um, the recommendation would be the better move would be to replace the current pool shell and the, the current systems that are there. So when we talked to the public about what their needs were for City Park Pool, and once again, back with the statistically valid survey and all the outreach, we heard A, lap swimming, very important, especially the 50-meter lap swimming course. Accessibility, better ways to get in and out of the pool. So you'll notice on this pool, there's a ramp that gets you to the 50-meter lap lanes. There are stairs that get you into the main pool area, and then there's a zero depth entry to get you into the rest of the, like the play feature part of the pool. So there's an immensely increased adapt adaptability of the pool for all kinds of people using the pool. Reduced carbon footprint, this has, uses a lot less water. Uh, we've had solar panels included. It would include some kind of inclusive locker rooms again, as we talked about at the other pool. More shade. What we heard from most people was, okay, if you need a new pool, that's fine, but we want it to feel like our city park pool. Don't mess with the trees. Gosh, we wouldn't. <laughs> Try to keep it about the same footprint. Our parking isn't going to increase, so we really can't increase the size or the area of the pool. So what you're seeing here is primarily within the fence line of the current pool. The only area that's outside is those blue cabanas, kind of that bottom little shape of the, the extra um, shape or the extra lawn area. The rest is within the, uh, the current pool structure. Uh, this would also, as we said, have the multi-purpose program space that would be available year round. And we would like to, we have in the capital improvement plan to replace the upper city park restrooms and shelters. So we'd like to incorporate those park restrooms into this building as well. So less plumbed shelter or buildings on the site, move them into one location for a better ease of service um, and include that with this project as well. One of the hot topics, or the hottest topic about this has been the number of lap lanes. It's a design, a design question at this point. But one thing I want to make sure that has not been very well discussed out with the public is that although we've gone to only showing three 50-meter lap lanes here, you'll notice that they are separate from the rest of the operations of the pool. So right now you have lap swim in the morning and at lunchtime. This would allow the three lanes of lap lanes essentially through the entire operational day of the pool. So fewer lanes, but a much larger time frame for use. Um, we are tracking the use out there right now this summer. Lunchtime is very busy, so I can see where the justification comes from more lap lanes. Um, but I think there's gonna be some trade-offs here between family needs, lap swimmer needs, instructional needs, all of those things uh, coming together in one facility. Okay. So let's talk a minute about the expense of all this. Not the capital expenses, but how much we're spending each year to operate the facilities. This was another surprising part about Robert A. Lee. If you look at the three facilities, Robert A. Lee by far gets the least amount of use and it's the most expensive one for us to operate. Um, based on the, the, this includes like capital repairs up to $5,000, so smaller pumps, smaller equipment like that. It doesn't include larger projects like a boiler replacement or the wading pool project at City Park Pool. City Park is a close second, but you gotta remember that we have 12 to 15 lifeguards on duty there at any one time, where Robert A. Lee is two, sometimes four. Um, but much smaller operation. And then Mercer is kind of the workhorse of the three facilities. Most of the swim team practices are there, uh, big aqua fitness there, lots of lap swimmers. You're getting a pretty good bang for the buck out of Mercer right now. Um, and I just think that that's important to see. Robert A. Lee being the aging pool is probably only going to increase in the costs as we continue down to go down this road.
All right, let's talk about what's currently in the budgets for the capital plan in the next few years. So we do have some money for general recreation center improvements, 250,000 for next year and 700,000. The recent re-demification project at Mercer took about the total of those two numbers to do. So that we're talking that's like one major system repair. That's not a, a full renovation budget for anything. Uh, we show money to replace the Robert A. Lee pool filter and to do a demification of that air system at Robert A. Lee. That estimate is about four years old, so I'm not sure that it is completely accurate on price. Mercer Ball Diamonds, as Brad mentioned, has 950000 slotted for next year for the baseball diamonds, and we'd also like to include pickleball tennis courts at that time with that project. City Park Pool is currently slated in, 2000, in FY24 and 25 at about $6 million. Based on current <laughs> prices we're seeing, that's probably not going to be enough. So we'll be getting some better estimates for that soon. But I also included the upper city park restrooms and shelters with that because as I said, we hope to include those in the same project. You would still have shelters out in the park, but the restrooms would be incorporated in with the pool building itself. Uh, rec center annual improvements, we have 50,000 each year. As I mentioned, the small um, AC project we're doing right now when it's 100 degrees out um, is <laughs> 41,000 to get the two meeting rooms air conditioned, just to give you a, an estimate of what, what that covers in one year. And then finally, we have a smaller account that we use for park ADA improvements. Some of the things noted in the plans, um, access into the facilities, ramps, those kind of things, those can be covered uh, by the park ADA fund. And we have done some of that even in the past year since they were identified. So overall, key findings of the summary. People like City Park Pool like it is, but they understand that it's going to take some renovations to keep it as a facility for the future. I didn't mention, early on you saw that there was a, a um, desire for um, Lazy River, thank you, <laughs> the Lazy River. And you didn't see that in the plan that was up there. You saw a current channel. The other thing that we've asked project architects and consultants on this is not only do we want a facility that meets the community needs, we really need to be realistic about what we can do for staffing and how many lifeguards it takes to operate these facilities. It's just, it's, it's something we've had to deal with for the last several years, even more so now since the pandemic. Iowa City has been really lucky. You supported our wage increase. We have enough lifeguards out there right now. The communities around us are not nearly as fortunate and we just see this being a continual issue. So when we looked at amenities, we said what eats up the most staff and a lazy river can take five or six staff um, to run. So that's not in the plans at this point, doesn't mean it could be added back in if that was a real community priority in the future. But we were looking at ways of how do we get the most use with the least amount of lifeguarding staff and the safest. Uh, Program-wise, we haven't talked about that nearly as much, but there is a whole range of program ideas and program priorities that the recreation staff has been implementing already. Right off the bat, we heard some concerns about aqua fitness and pool hours. Some of those things have already been addressed, and we're continuing to change our programming based on the feedback we've received through this process. Adding programs for teens, some of that Mercer remodel included a space that would be for like esports and some other teen things that we're hearing are, are very popular. Um, supply and demand gaps exist in adult fitness, wellness, nature, aquatic, and inclusive and adaptive program use. So when we talk adult fitness, that hits some of the top things you've been hearing about. So the walking track, aqua fitness in the pool, therapy in the pool, and lap swimming, all, and pickleball. How could I forget pickleball? <laughs> Those are all big adult fitness priorities, different than what we were probably talking about 10 years ago. We're not seeing adult softball leagues. We're saying pickleball is the new adult sport and the thing that people want, lap swim. So when we talk adult fitness, we mean different things than we used to. Um, the warm water pool, it supports not only the aqua fitness part of this, but it supports our every child learns how to swim. Why is that important? We're also trying to grow our own crop of lifeguards down the road. If kids don't learn to swim when they're in elementary school, they're not gonna be qualified to be lifeguards 10 years down the road. So this is all part of the big master plan of getting people introduced early and uh, comfortable with aquatics and swimming. 
Um, additional facility spaces for multi-purpose. We talked about satellite facilities, potentially Weatherby Park, which we've been talking with some potential partner groups about um, having a facility there. City Park Pool having a, a multi-purpose space for programming, something on the west side eventually, and either space at Mercer or east side sports eventually too. So having us be able to take our programs and staff out to the people in their actual neighborhoods as we go down. And then prioritization of the outdoor um, facilities, which Brad talked through, Mercer being the top one at this point. But just a general sense of people were saying, invest in what you have first. Before we move on to East Side Sports, make sure you invest in the current fields and facilities that we already have at, in place. The th feedback themes, I'll just go through these one more time. City Park Pool, phase two. Now, remember phase one had statistically valid surveys and a lot of equity outreach. Phase two was largely based on, we put the information out, we did public notices, we sent emails out to all of our aqua fitness, lap swimmers, aquatic pass holders, uh, we did press releases, all that, but we didn't go out and do actual in neighborhood um, or focus groups. So we had a lot of uh, particular interest groups that are really highly represented in these. But not enough lap lanes, they prefer the traditional footprint of the pool, um, and people like that, that there was a zero depth or a beachfront entry for all sorts of people with uh, mobility issues or kids, families. Indoor pool, a lot of people prefer the downtown location. That doesn't show up in our actual use numbers though, but that's what was preferred in the feedback we received in phase two. Um, worry about being cost prohibitive, and a feeling through the input that it was more accessible, which is kind of the opposite of what we heard in our phase one feedback and Parks and Rec Commission feedback that we'd received before that. Indoor program space, the indoor walking track was, was a big one. Positive overall sentiment over that, fitness is great. They like the concept of the decentralization, so having the programming spaces in the north side, the south side, um, and need a little more information on that. And then athletic field priorities, like we said, Mercer Park first, Eastside Sports uh, a second one, and then continuing with City Park, Kickers, and Napoleon. And finally, our next steps. So here we have for each one of us what still needs to be done with this plan. This is kind of our, our check-in point. But Council, um, we're asking you to help confirm the priorities and strategies presented in this update review the plan and document at a later date. So we'll be back late summer, early fall. We'll also go back through the Park Commission before it comes back to you as a final plan. People have asked for all of the data and all the survey responses. That will all be published on the website along with the facility um, assessments that were done of the facilities. So our plan is to have all of that publicly available. Uh, Parks Commission will review, like I said, August, September timeline. Staff will address some of the smaller things which he's already been doing, some of the smaller ADA concerns, some of the programming concerns. Um, we'll be including the priorities from this as we go into the next budget cycle this fall and into the winter. So you'll be seeing these kind of things come through with our um, operational budgets and with our larger capital asks that we do and working to educate the community a little bit more about the plan. If anything, we heard so many, heard a lot of misconceptions about what was actually in here. So we realized that there's more outreach effort needed to say, here's what it means, here's how we got to that point. And then the consultants will be refining this based on the feedback received, um, getting the final plan document ready and we'll have that published at that point. That's a lot, and it's a huge plan covering a lot of different areas, so um, be happy to answer questions, any of us from the presentation team. Have at a council. I have a quick question on the, with the lazy river concept. It, <clears throat> where, where can one find a lazy river in Johnson County? The University of Iowa. Yeah, CRWC. Will you repeat that, please? Uh, she said University of Iowa Recreation Pool. That's a smaller one, I believe, right? Yeah. Oh. Uh, the outdoor ones are generally much larger. You see them at like theme parks or larger aquatic centers. Um, I 
had a question about the portion of the survey that was um, where there was questions for current users and then questions kind of directed towards non-users. Do you have a sense of the breakdown of the volume of input of like those who use facilities and gave their thoughts versus capturing some of those people who were non-users? Yeah, we're hearing two thirds, one third, two thirds users, yeah. one third non-users. Okay, and was that in? I feel like that was maybe in a later survey part, or was that in the statistically valid survey? It was on the social. Pin. It was on the, the social. social pin. Pin. Okay, so that was the give reactions to kind of ideas that are posted. Um, actually, no, that was in phase one, in the beginning of the process. So that the. the the um, survey, the social, the um, statistically accurate survey and social pinpoint were going on at the same time. Okay. And you, when you entered the portal, it did ask you questions about are you a current user or not, and it directed you through those particular questions. Gotcha. So it was of that 600 and some number that we saw? Okay. Thank you. And then I had a question about the participation statistics. So are those unique individuals or like users where if you had a participant who took swim lessons and then also signed up for softball, those were two separate participants? It's each individual registration, so it was not unique users. Okay. The unique users were reflected in the heat map. Okay. To, to make sure I articulate the difference, the heat map was a unique household. The user enrollment statistics is every single enrollment regardless if you sign up for a five or one. And about the heat map then, while you're still up here, thank you. Sure. Um, it looked like there was some of that blue or much less intense area right downtown. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we have where people are most concentrated was one of the lower usage areas. Is that something that you expected, or how do you interpret that? So we, we did ask the community members to say, hey, you know, we, we sit right by the river downtown. What we learn, because we don't live here, but from understanding folks that do live here, you have a high concentration of students who live in that area, which would align with the fact that the students historically can use the resources provided by the university and therefore may choose that. They're already paying for that service mm -hmm. and um, meeting the needs of the, the rest of the community. Um, you. you Definitely saw what we saw right away. So what's going on? What's going on by the river? And that there was uh, someone on the consulting team actually is very familiar with the the community. And Julie, is that consistent with what we expect as far as you know historical user data? We just don't capture a lot of students. Right. Um, realize that most of our programs are geared towards younger individuals, families, or adults and older. And you're right. We don't do a lot with the college age kids or residents. I have one, one last question. The, there was a slide with the three indoor pools and the years and the amounts um, were, that really seemed favorable with Mercer for this year. Was the 2022 number, is that extrapolated to what we expect the annual to be or is that like year to date up through? So it's actually, it's year to date, but realize we have only one more pay cycle in this fiscal year. So okay. it's pretty darn close to accurate, and okay. most of the large expenses have been made for this fiscal year. Gotcha. Sorry, I was thinking calendar year, yeah. so thank you. I have a couple of questions as well. Um, with the participation enrollment slide, it was mentioned that it was for 2019. Had there been any like more historical, either an aggregate, like 2014 to 2019, or like some kind of looking year by year to see if the numbers shifted, if they grew, if they shrunk? It just seems to me that, um, I mean, I'm so glad that COVID was not you know included in that, but it seems like one year only to track participation seems a little short yeah. to me. Um, we actually only did look at 2019. We have some had some different changes in software that make it pretty difficult to do the years before that. And I totally agree, having more than one year would have been a better alternative. Um, but we didn't feel like the COVID years were at all oh. accurate. So we did the best we could with, with what we had. Sure. One other question, and I think this is much more speculatory, if that's a word. Um, in the... Um, actually relative to the heat map, um, saying that in fact the west side had pretty good coverage um, or usage, right? 
I'm wondering, though, is there any way to discern that if Robert A. Lee Pool was closed, if they would still be served, right? And I do know that there's, I trust and believe, I love the idea of going into the neighborhoods, but I just wondered, specific to pool usage, I don't know if you can kind of drill down and find out whether So we don't something. have statistical um, information to share with you on that. We do have information where we've talked to a swim, number of the swim lesson parents because that is the mm -hmm. primary use. When you see okay. people from the west side using Robert A. Lee, it's because that's where swim lessons are offered primarily right now. If we had a warm water pool in another location, um, they've all indicated they would rather go <laughs> into a warm water newer facility. So I don't know that that would be a determining factor. Um, very few people are using transit to get to Robert A. Lee. Um, it's people driving in and having um, difficulties when we have other events and whatnot, having downtown for parking and that sort of thing. So, My final question, I say right now, my final question for now is regarding actually parking at Mercer, because it is serving baseball fields and the park itself, as well as what could be this, you know, much refined and multi-use area at the pool, and yet... Uh, when you were speaking about the downtown location, about one of the prohibitors to it being a good location for continued pool use was parking. But it seems to me Mercer doesn't have a huge amount of parking either, and if this becomes the de facto pool, is that something that was taken into consideration, that there would be enough parking for swimmers to be able to get in and out and use the facilities um, easily? Sure, and I think that that's definitely a concern. Is is there enough parking there? We feel like there probably is because the majority of the parking spaces are, are used for tournaments, and that's not an everyday occurrence. Uh, whereas downtown, every Saturday during the summer, you know, farmers market takes over the parking lot and a number of other activities. So, based on the input we receive from every group, except for the the current lap swimmers at Robert A. Lee, the the other groups all said they would rather navigate parking at Mercer than at Robert A. Lee. So Julie, do you think, um, this is kind of a hypothetical question, <laughs> if, if the city were to offer some sort of a parking permit for those folks that want to use the pool at, at uh, Robert A. Lee, would that help, do you think, since that seems to be an issue, I mean, to pay for parking and to find parking? Uh, yeah, that, that's an issue for a lot of folks. Yeah. I think that's a bigger question because our parking lot is popular for a number of reasons beyond Robert A. Lee that I think is important to know. And I, I know that you know whether you're talking Robert A. Lee at Mercer, people still don't like to park in the farther ends of either one of the lots or in Chauncey at the ramp. So I'm not sure that anything's going to completely solve that. And definitely not free parking at Robert A. Lee because then there would never be any spaces. Um, based on other people unless we had some kind of mechanism that allowed like the senior center does um, for just use if they're in the pool area. Yeah. Julie, do you have any sense if, um, I don't know what use of Robert A. Lee what looked like in previous years, but do you have any sense if the, if the pool use has gone down because of, uh, there's a perception that the, you know, that it's not as modern a place that it needs work that people are, are are less comfortable there in the in the locker rooms in the pool area itself could that be a factor in the in what we're seeing in terms of usage right now plus plus it's been closed for chunks of time i yeah. think and so that people the people know that it's open or when it's open I think there's a lot of hype, hypothetical parts of that question. Sure. What I can say is that in the six years that I've had my office in that building, I've never seen that pool fully used except when either the Coralville pool or the University pool or Mercer was, was closed. At those times, we saw huge increases in people wanting to swim there. It's not acceptable as a competitive pool any longer, so we don't ever have a swim meet component or anything like that to it. Prior to this plan, we had uh, users coming to the Parks Commission asking for things like better locker rooms, concerns about the other locker room uses, the access, the parking, and then more importantly, the access actually into the pool water itself. So, and until recently, we had a lot of issues with temperature up and down. It seems like we've been able to manage that better since some recent repairs. 
but it is warmer water. It's not always warmer water because it's an older system that breaks down fairly often. So I think all of those things weigh into this whether Robert A. Lee is used as much as it's used to. Our statistics from 2019 say that on an average day, we had 35 people using that pool from 6 in the morning till 9 at night. That's not much when you spread it out over that whole time. Um, our looking at the security cameras back in May, a lot of the time, zero, one, maybe two swimmers. A few times we have six lap swimmers, but only for about 45 minutes at a time. Um, Aqua Fitness does bring in more people at, at different times based on the instructors and popularity. Um, but overall use of that as something you're investing this much money into, as a director, I have to say, is that our wisest course? Yes, it provides another aquatic facility. Yes, people love aquatics. But if it breaks, if something significant breaks down tomorrow, do you want to put a huge investment back in that pool or put it somewhere else is the question we're getting to. One of the other things that's been that you didn't really, that wasn't really touched on because it's not part, really part of this, this vision is when I think of more modern facilities in the area, I think, for example, North Liberty, um, and that North Liberty has managed to sort of create an all-in-one facility with indoor pool, outdoor pool, library, rec center, everything all together. And then I think of the land and the, and the, the capacity that we potentially could have at City Park um, that, that um, you're ta already talking about putting a building in there, uh, which made me wonder, would there be potentially the possibility to sort of create a dual pool there so that there could be, and, and then you yeah. could have um, somehow an enhanced bus loop if, you know, in the best of all possible worlds. Um, but because really you're talking about a pool right now that's only open a few months a year um, that, that takes a lot of expense and, 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 and it's going to be a huge investment. And is there a way to um, <clears throat> in, sort of increase both the use and utility of that whole area? I think that's an excellent question. It's not one that we really entertained in this plan, uh, primarily because of the love of City Park Pool as a historical place that people love for its outdoor space under the trees. And I, I didn't get any feedback saying that, you know, maybe do indoor. It doesn't mean it wouldn't be a possibility. It just wasn't part of really what was brought up during this planning process. I did have a, um, maybe some questions related to the geographic decentral, uh, decentralization to promote access. Um, I know that the council prior to the plan being um, uh, kind of researched, we do know that there's a facility space challenge, you know, uh, within the community. And we talked about those partnerships uh, with non-city owned facilities. Can someone speak a little bit more to what the, what the plans are and what does it mean when you're talking about geographic um, decentralization? I wasn't exactly sure. Sure. And I think that's because we don't have all the details figured out. Um, on the South District side, uh, with a Weatherby, I think it would definitely would be a partnership with neighborhood centers or some other nonprofit. We have an interest in seeing recreational opportunities brought out to those different neighborhoods. Doesn't necessarily need to always be through parks and recreation staff. So we think that that could be a real nice component, some kind of partnership facility there that has potentially their uses during the day, and then it's available for either recreation programs or community uses in the evening. Um, the other way I've been s describing these facilities is think of it more like an enclosed park shelter than an actual rec center. Now, if it was a partnership with another group that had additional needs, it might be more fancy. But we're really talking about a basic indoor space for about 50 people to sit down if you were going to do a, a potluck and maybe a catering kitchen type thing. But just a really... Um, flexible space for us to bring out either we bring out smaller recreation programs or some of our steam classes some of our um, maybe it's an indoor space for some of the youth sports to start their programming in maybe it's girls on the run needs a, a meeting space those kind of things or the actual neighborhoods actually need um, space for their community meetings um, their neighborhood potlucks those kind of things so a real multi-purpose space at this point 
I know that um, at the beginning of the presentation, you talked about this being, you know, a, a long, long-term, big picture. But in the presentation, I didn't hear as much um, when it comes down to our growth areas, spaces where we'll be annexing. And so I didn't hear that in the presentation. So um, are we... So I, we have been talking extensively about what might happen out towards the west, um, but those plans have really not developed in the timeline that was in concert with this plan. So although it says if, a, if something would become available in the area, say west of 218, here's what we should look at next for putting out there. Um, and we left it at that stage. Okay. Yeah, if I could uh, just add to that, there is a line item in your CIP anticipating acquisition of parkland on the west side, probably around that Carson Farms area west of 218, south of Rarit. Um, but because that annexation is still pending and we're still going through some master planning in that area, really hard to hard to commit a, a concept or an idea to, to ground that we don't own or we don't know will be part of the city. But clearly, I think there is an opportunity for um, a destination style park, a, a larger park uh, feature that could include a rec center, could include indoor decentralized space. Uh, 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 along with potential annexation out there. As we look at our other growth area on the on the east side, that's where we really see the east side sports complex coming in and, and serving uh, that growth area there as well. Thank you. So, so I have one more sort of what if question for you, which is- My favorite. Have there, have, there, have you talked at all or has there been any conversations with the university? Because um, I don't know how heavily the pool at their large fitness center downtown is used. I don't know if there are, say, times there that would really, that could that could be a good fit if the the city were to contribute some to have, to to be able to do sort of downtown swimming there. Yeah, we haven't. I would say based on the number of swimmers that we get at Robert A. Lee, I'm sure that they have the capacity to to include those if if that was the direction we wanted to attempt to go. So. I'm aware that they, there are also swim lessons there. Right. I think they're they're led by students, but they're because we're, we're talking about a relatively small area with at least two large pools right now, and a, and a, and a pretty small, in the larger scheme of things, pretty small urban area. Um, when and you look at pools in Coralville and North Liberty and elsewhere, we, we've got a lot of facilities in a, in a pretty small area. We do, and we also have a lot of lap swimmers in Aqua Fitness Bar. I mean, it's aquatics here is, uh, we've heard from the consultants, unlike any other community they've been in, the strong um, feelings towards it, so. All right, thank you all for presenting. Any other um, questions for staff? And then we'll have council just kind of um, give any uh, further remarks. I have one question, and it's actually, it works really well because it's about the sort of what are the next steps, and it was about council confirming. Yeah, so. <laughs> like the, with the priorities. Yeah. Are you talking at a large scale about sort of that, that triangle, or that pyramid, mm -hmm. the pyramid of equity and access and then moving down? Is that what you want, or about the priorities about like, the second to the, the last, the second to the last slide where we had about the seven okay. different areas, we'd like some feedback on those areas. Okay. Are we headed down the right <laughs> road with city park pool? Not with specific design, you know, number of lanes, number of this, number of that, but are we headed modernizing the right? it, for yeah. instance? Okay. Um, as we look to our programming, are we headed in the right direction, looking at some satellite programming spaces if they become available, and, and working on our program mix that way? Athletic fields, are we looking at Mercer as being our top priority, which is, it is in the budget right now? And then the big aquatics questions. What does the future of aquatics look like? And it's not a tomorrow answer. Um, I think even if we were to move forward with some kind of a, a additional complex or additional indoor pool, that's gonna take some time. There is no funding right now for that price tag. Um, but you're probably going to be confronted first with some kind of large scale repair or maintenance item that needs to be done at Robert A. Lee. And, and we'll need some feedback about do we do that or do we wait and do something different? And I maybe ask Jeff if he wants to add any other. Yeah, I, th I think it'd be helpful to maybe just do a quick uh, comparison with the um, 
Parks Master Plan that was adopted in 2016. Um, and that focused on your traditional, your parks, and it, it intentionally left out the facilities that we're talking about today. But with, with that implementation, um, staff could really just charge ahead and, and go through because most of those improvements are at a 300, 500, maybe $700,000 scale, uh, which is all very manageable when it comes into working into the budget over a five, six, seven year period. Um, this master plan is on a whole different level here. Um, as we move forward, we want to make sure that you, you generally agree with the direction that we're going because the last thing we want to do is get into a multi-million dollar project only to find out that the council really didn't want us to go that way. Um, so, you know, our next steps are going to be to refine our budget proposal to you in September, right? We're going to finish the plan, we'll present the plan and share it with the community, but then we have to take some pretty big next steps. And what we've signaled uh, in anticipation of this plan with the last budget is that City Park Pool is the first major reinvestment that we need to make. And by major, I'm talking multi-million dollar investment that we need to make. It's going to be really important that uh, over the next several months we, we're on the same page between staff and council on what you want to see. That doesn't mean that the exact design, that you, the concept that was shown is, is the answer. Again, that, that was a tool to get some more feedback. Um, we can refine that and there will be public input in that design process, but we need to make sure that you're comfortable going down that path. Um, we also have to do long-term planning for revenue sources. Th this isn't something that we can just, that just shows up in a budget. You know, a $9 million expansion to Mercer just doesn't happen overnight. It could take new revenue sources. It could take pursuit of, of grants that can take several years. Uh, it could take a, a referendum. Um, uh, it, there's multiple paths that can go down, but each of those paths could require a year or more of planning, unlike, again, those more sim simplistic um, parks, playground replacements, and shelter additions, and things like that. I wouldn't say they were all so simple. <laughs> <laughs> the parks, just kidding. But I have a, a re sort of a revenue uh, question, which is you, you, you mentioned in a couple of places that there is a 28E agreement with City High and the, um, and the school district for use of the, the pool at Mercer and the fields at Mercer. Does that include uh, financial? It does for operations. Um, it has changed over the years. The history of that pool is it was built originally so that they could have junior high swimming lessons as part of the pool, and it had a significant use from the school district. Um, they stopped doing that mm, seven, eight years ago, maybe. Um, so they still pay us money through the 28E, um, but they don't have quite the use interest in it that they used to. All right. Thank you much. So, Council, this is major, right? This is a, a, a major thing to talk about. What I might suggest um, is certainly that we um, feel free to make any comments, but we know that the public is still going to want to um, comment on this presentation now that it's going to be made uh, even more public through media. Um, I would suggest that we also have this on our next work agenda, work session, just to continue the conversation. Uh, we can certainly have it now, um, but I think it will be more, it will be continuing this conversation a little bit, but I'll open it up. All right, well, I'll, I'll start, and maybe I'll start with City Park Pool because that, that is the one that's the most most likely to move forwards uh, first. And I, I was certainly open to the idea of, of changes to City Park Pool uh, with, with that significant you know, question as to will it alter the aesthetic character of that facility. And uh, again, we're looking at a preliminary drawing, but I have to say when I look at that preliminary drawing, the that aesthetic character of the pool, uh, which I kind of view as a, a sort of classic simplicity of a pool and a forest, um, isn't represented in that proposal. Um, so my feeling is there's a lot of work that needs to be done if we're going to bring it into consistency with, with that character. 
uh, I've I've talked to a number of people about how they have kind of navigated, you know, the, the aquatics with regard to city park pool and, and the idea of an aquatic center element. And, and what they would say was, well, we, we love city park pool. And we want, when we wanted to go to an aquatic center, we'd go to Coralville. And um, that makes a whole lot of sense to me, given what, at least what I'm seeing in the city park pool concept, the, try, the, the attempt to integrate that quality is extremely challenging, and I, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, an outcome which I could live with uh, in that current proposal. Uh, one, one suggestion I would make is that the, um, and this applies to all the facilities, in my view, uh, it's we're trying to provide things for people to do, and we're trying to provide safe, equitable access to those facilities. Uh, one concept that, that I think might be worth exploring would be, since we're only talking three months out of the year, providing some kind of uh, summer session uh, public transit access to Coralville so that we um, address that equity gap if, and access gap if we have that. Um, I have a name for it. I, wanna call, I, I would like to suggest we call it the Aqua Bus. Um, as a way of, of bridging that gap that we have now. Um, but that pool is only three miles away from City Park Pool. It's really pretty close. It seems to me we could, we could bridge it. Um, Robert A. Lee, um, again, the idea that we're trying to provide with our recreation lots of things to do and provide safe, equitable access. With a citywide facility like an indoor pool, it seems to me we really need to focus on public transit as an important element of how we provide that access. And the centrality of Robert A. Lee, uh, in my view, is far superior to Mercer in terms of really all modes, but especially transit. So I'm very hesitant to, to give up Robert A. Lee because of that centrality. I understand there are issues with the existing condition. It's a 58-year-old facility. I mean, I, I really do feel that some of the issues we're seeing now, in addition to COVID, are related to the fact that it's a, it's a facility or a pool which is at that point in its life where we need to reinvest in it um, and, and revisit the program. So in my view, the idea would be to simply um, commit to the location and then re rethink what that pool is so that we better get a better match uh, between what we're hearing in the report, which I think had outstanding information regarding you know, programming issues, uh, and apply that to Robert A. Lee. I, I would also be interested in seeing if we can identify something that's missing in our regional systems of indoor pools that might be able to fit at Robert A. Lee so that it has that additional appeal. I mean, it's an, an indoor pool. That means it's open all year round. I, I feel that all year round access is extremely important through the winter. And if we can offer something that is not found anywhere else, I think that would help promote the, the use of the pool beyond you know its kind of current everyday use that we see now. And, and maybe I'll stop there. I mean, I, I have other thoughts, but I, you know, I don't want to take up too, and we have limited time before we have to break. I would just sort of tack on to what Councillor Thomas said as far as the Robert A. Lee. Uh, you mentioned that it seems like it's not used that much, but I think maybe Councillor Weiner uh, questioned about uh, the aesthetics of it, and perhaps that has deterred people from there. But uh, if, if we were to modernize it and make those improvements and make sure that the water temperature was the same and consistent and, and it was more usable, uh, perhaps the use would go up. Because as a West Sider, I, I see using that pool versus going clear across to the east side of town uh, to, to do Mercer all the time. So uh, I, I prefer trying to do what we can with Robert A. Lee. So uh, on a different top topic on the sort of in terms of prioritization of um, when we're looking at outdoor facilities, um, I, I personally would agree with, with prioritizing Mercer outdoor facilities. I would probably skip 
the East Side Sports Complex. We have, we're coming into a time of, re of real fiscal constraint. Um, I, my personal um, preference would be to focus on facilities we have, expand facilities we have if possible. I mean, may maybe you could even put in a ball, ball field. At, I don't know if there's interest in putting in a field or a soccer field at, at Weatherby, for example. There's a lot of, there's a lot of room there, or other other places where there is room, rather than creating a whole new facility that what, that would have to be accessed by car when we're looking at climate issues and trying to um, trying to get people to um, not, we hope, not drive as much. Actually, I'll follow up on your comments. Um, I don't actually have a lot of specifics to add in terms of um, prioritizing specific pools or whatnot. I really want to listen more, learn more. Um, I commend the work that's been done already. It was incredibly detailed and, and dug in at several levels, and I was very impressed by the number of times in which we said, well, what about? And it was like, well, we've thought of, we did consider this, and I just, I wanna commend everybody who worked on this. It was a huge effort. Um, but one of the things that I keep circling back to and that I keep hearing is just the monumental price tag to all of this. And so, I think one of the things that I need to keep myself aware of and, and, and honestly to, to let the public know as well that probably not 100% of people are going to be happy with what the final solution is um, or solutions, but I, I like very much the framing of what does the future of aquatics, what does the future of our facilities look like, and I think that that to me is a really good North Star, along with the priorities that have been enumerated by all of the different ways that we've had public input. So I don't have any specifics to comment on right now um, because I really want to gather more input, uh, but I just, these are the things that are striking me. I absolutely agree that I think we need to make not make do, we need to improve upon and create a better future of our existing facilities um, first and foremost, but just be aware that even that is going to have a huge price tag. And so we're really gonna have to consider that in a, in, in a very, very realistic way, um, what the cost of all of this is going to be and what we can do that will create the best effect for um, our really, really varied community, so. I'd just like to to echo what what you said in terms of thanking you all for all the work that's gone into this and the and all the detail and all the outreach. Really, really grateful. I'm just wondering on the revenue side. I I hear staff and Jeff, you've done a good job of saying, tell us what you prioritize and we'll figure out how to fund it. You know, and 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 I feel like something like the possibility of a future recreation facilities referendum is kind of categorically different than anything we've dealt with yet. And I don't know if that's sort of sharp part of our strategic planning or, you know, but I, for me as, as a decision maker, I feel very differently about these price tags. You know, when you're talking five, seven, nine million dollars, if that means trading out other capital improvements versus finding a funding source that would be for that particular thing. So that's just new territory that I don't, I'm not really sure how to that's move on that. That's a, that's a very good yeah, I think that's, that's part of those next steps, is once we understand that vision, then we come and we figure out how to, how to put all those pieces together. But you know, keep in mind, that's how, that's how Mercer Scanlon was built, was community referendum. That's why we have the library downtown, because the voters approved it. So there are points in time in which, if you strongly believe in something, you go and you ask for that support, and you see uh, if it's there. Um, there are other ways to fund it, um, uh, can be more difficult, can take a longer period of time. But without that vision, without us being able to tell the story to the public on this is where we're going, to, to get support is, is, is a non-starter. So that's, that's kind of this early phase that we're in. Let's figure out exactly where we want to be, and then we'll, we'll develop the paths and we can explore which one is, is uh, uh, maybe the best one uh, down the road a little bit. 
But what's also important, sorry, um, is, is something that Julie alluded to a couple times in her presentations. We have master plans that we haven't fully executed on. Mm -hmm. uh, City Park is one. City Park master plan was a, I don't know, $20 million master plan. But while we haven't been able to carry out that entire plan, when we make incremental improvements, we're doing so in alignment with that plan. We're building the playground further away from the river. We're, we're making ball fields improvements to make them more flood resistant. All those things are in concert with the plan, and that's probably an expectation here, especially with the, the two rec centers, is we may not be able to do this in $9 million chunks or $10 million chunks, but when it comes time to invest $2 million, we're going we're gonna to know where we want to go, and that money is going to be used very wisely and be a building block to the next investment. In the interest of time, I think I'm certainly going to be uh, gathering more input from the public as now this will be um, he, uh, hit in the ears of a lot of people within our community. The one thing I will say is um, this is the long-term you know, goal. So for me, when I hear about the East Side Sports Complex, immediately um, I would say, you know, we need to have it in the plan because we're beginning with the end in mind, but also realizing that um, the funding opportunities we're going to have to figure out along the way. So I, I do believe um, in a lot of what's happening here, again, I just want to hear a little bit more from the public. You know, I have some initial reactions. Um, I think the, you know, the staff with the RAL, um, their report on the usage, I think uh, that is important. But also, you know, in the same breath, think about uh, the partnerships that we talked about with non-city-owned uh, facilities. University is near. So uh, that's where my mind goes to what opportunities uh, can we explore there. If you don't ask, you'll never know. Other than that, I will uh, say I, I'm done with my comments there. Anything else? Well, I'll, I'll just touch on the outdoor facilities um, and the satellites. Um, I know council has heard me say many times, uh, you know, that I'm, my, my vision is, is kind of framed by the idea of what has been called the 15 minute city, which is essentially that we try and it has, it has to do with access that uh, every, everyone in Iowa City, no matter where they happen to be, within 15 minutes can meet most of their everyday needs by either walking or bicycling. Now, when we're talking about the indoor pools, it, 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 you know, that's a citywide facility, so it, it probably ne needs to be adjusted to you know, 20 minutes by transit or something to that effect as, as the other piece. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the idea of the, the, the geographic decentralization thrust. I think that begins to capture the idea that we need our facilities to scale at different levels. So we have citywide, we have district rain level facilities, and then we have neighborhood facilities. And, and so there are ways in which people can engage with one another in our recreation system in different ways and at different scales. Um, I think it's very important for children in particular to benefit from that neighborhood scale focus because they, in my view, desperately need to be provided spaces which would allow for self-directed play in outdoor settings. Sort of, you know, we, we as a city can provide the, the setting and the context, but let them play uh, without that adult supervision hanging over their head. And so that, that has to happen, in my view, in a neighborhood context. So to the degree we can achieve that fine grain, you know, it can be micro soccer. It doesn't have to be a full scale soccer field. I saw it, the, the video of the Juneteenth. They set up a little soccer field on uh, Chauncey Swan Park. So, so it's possible at the neighborhood scale to scale things down uh, to fit the settings so that children have easy access so that they can entertain themselves uh, away from adults. I, I just feel that that's really essential as we move forward. All right, we're gonna move on to clarification of agenda items.
Info packet, June 9th. I know that we are almost at time, um, but I just want to mention that there was um, an article that I sent out to council um, on different community responses for gun violence, and I would definitely like to revisit that um, perhaps after our regular session. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to come back <laughs> because we have a presentation. So, yeah. Yeah. That will about the IP4 from yes. June 16th. But anything else for June 9th? Um, with the exception of, um, we'll move on to June 16th with the exception of IP4. We're going to have to come back to that after. And Mayor, just to clarify, we don't have a presentation on IP4, but we would like some direction okay. from the council if Great. you're comfortable with that um, grant program. Okay. If you're just needing uh, comments, then I don't know if people are prepared. The, I did have one question about that. Um, so ex expenses incurred after March 3rd, 2021 is when this will... Um, eligibility process B. I'm concerned that if we only have $400,000 that, um, I mean, people's budget could, you know, take that over right away. Sure. So that's the eligibility date for the ARPA funds. We could, re we could revise that to starting, you know, at the beginning of the grant period. We could, we could change that timeline. Yeah. I'm just concerned that it's $400,000 and you know, this money is to be used before or by 2026. So that's where my concern is. That, uh, that, that it's too small an amount? Well, it's too small of an amount for the potential of the applicants. Yeah, that, so if, we go, if we're going back, I, I think I'm more comfortable moving forward than going back. But it, that's just my thought process. Because I, people would have paid whatever by then. They would have had monies. I mean, perhaps this could be something where um, uh, within the application process, there's just some place where they can explain how post-pandemic they have been impacted. Sure. Yep. You know, I mean, that, that then would sort of show that if, like, if it wasn't for COVID, we wouldn't quite be in this kind of a situation. <laughs> just to put it really, really generally, that might be a way around it while being able to move that timeline up. Because I you're, I agree, they had to find the money somehow, some way, or just do away with it. And so now they're at a place saying, back in 2021, we had this need, we didn't, we couldn't fill it. We'd be like, we'd like to have that money now so that we can fill that gap. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? I mean, we're still in the pandemic, whatever. Oh, yeah, whatever, I, whatever yes, says. thank and you so for that. So we have the ability to use this money for several years going forward. Right. I just, I, so what I hear you saying, Mayor, is that the 400000 is not sufficient mm -hmm. for the grant program. Well, it's not, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not for sufficient. We already, we already know we won't have enough money, right? So it's not sufficient. But my, my biggest concern is that when the agencies apply, if, we're, if they're going to be you know, going all the way back, there just isn't enough money. So we're compounding the hardship on trying to, you know, help agencies. So my thought is if agencies are, they survived, you know, they, they paid some money, um, they figured it out, but we need to look at how can we move forward and support them as the pandemic, as you mentioned, is still impacting services. So I don't know if anyone um, would agree, you know would support maybe moving this date to. Um, uh, July we just 1. do it when the, when we are, when we release the, or, or award like, the oh. grants. You know, it's typically just you know moving forward. This is going to be helping your needs moving forward and clarify that uh, past expenses won't be eligible. That's that's perfectly normal okay. for a grant program. Yeah. That and it, it goes in line with what we've already approved for CWJ as well. 
So are people in agreement? Mm -hmm. All right, we have majority support for that. Yeah. Any other comments about this? Just promote the heck out of it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and thank you for working yes. to wrap this all together so quickly. Yes. Thank you. All right, we're gonna pause here and we'll return back to our work, se work session after our formal meeting. All right. Where were we anyway? Uh, we are policy. at information okay. packets. Um, so we're gonna go with June 9th, information packet. Um, I just wanted to call out IP3, uh, which is that article <coughs> that came out pretty recently uh, that was a compendium of different community solutions um, or ways that the communities could address gun violence. Um, and just as takeaways, uh, there's no single solution um, and that whatever efforts there are, they have to be deliberate and coordinated among different you know, community groups, agencies, city, county, um, and they're, they're multifaceted, right? Um, it is about getting to root causes. And so I was very much in thinking of, um, John, what you talk about you know, with, with healthy neighborhoods because one of the first um, suggestions was in fact to have public spaces and affordable housing which where people can feel safe um, to allow for simply better quality of life. Um, so anyway. I'm, I spoke a lot during formal meetings, so I just want to um, put this before us so that we can start having these conversations in a meaningful and deliberate way. I know there is a county effort um, called the Gun Violence Intervention Program that is sort of just getting up on its legs, and I know there's a number of um, different entities that are involved and they're taking their cues or certainly taking some lessons from what's going on uh, productively in Cedar Rapids but I would very much like for us to bring our chairs full and tuck right into that table and to talk about it so that we can um, figure out what's gonna work for our communities as well. I think this was a great article and I would also um, encourage uh, you know the city to get involved with the Johnson County. I'm not sure if we have a staff. Our police department's been involved from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I really do feel that we should have someone from council on there if, if there's still opportunity for us to jump on board. I, I can check with the county attorney. It's, it's really the, the county attorney's office is leading that, so um, yeah. it'd be up to Janet and her okay. staff. Okay. Um, what I do know is that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors has allocated over a million dollars. Um, and so. I just feel like there should be a representative that should be selected by the council um, if we do get that opportunity, uh, one of us to be present. I would agree. I was When I went to the March for Our Lives up in Cedar Rapids, they, they have a, prog one, a, a similar program that's been running in Cedar Rapids for several years. The person who runs that program spoke very eloquently about how, uh, how they got into the community and the progress it's made there. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see it here. It needs to be, you know, like stood up. Um, and, and I'm really happy that I'm thrilled that Johnson County has funded it uh, and agree that it would be helpful to have someone participating if we, are, if we can. One of the pieces that this article highlighted was about data collection. And I was just wondering, Jeff, with uh, Dave Schwint no longer on our department, but also with the department being kind of staffing back back up now, do we have someone in that role? Are we, I mean, what's the status of Yeah, so um, Officer Schwint was a full-time crime analyst while he was still a sworn police officer. Um, after he retired, um, we hired him back on part-time as an hourly employee. So he's working um, oh, maybe 10 to 15 hours a week or so. I'm just kind of guessing there. But um, to, to continue to pull the basic data together, 
and Chief Liston and his leadership team are evaluating what they want to do with that position, um, whether to keep it a sworn position. Uh, obviously, Dave had some um, very unique skills and abilities when it came to, to data management. Uh, a lot of departments will civilianize that uh, crime analyst position and target somebody with background in statistics and data collection. So they're evaluating those options. In the meantime, Officer Schwintz, uh, with us in a civilian ca capacity helping us. So um, I don't have an exact answer for you on when that decision may come and, and uh, uh, what that looks like, but we're still able to you know, pull the data that we need to inform this discussion. Great. Thank you. Any other comments from IP um, from June 9th? IP to the um, legislative session report. Uh, special thanks to Rachel and the Car Carney and Appleby lobbyist. Uh, with an upcoming election in November, it it clearly uh, shows that it, it's very important uh, to uh, to vote and and to follow up on these issues and and hold our elected officials accountable uh, for these things. And I hope that we can continue to have a lobbyist there uh, to have um, ears on the ground for us. I was I was going to call attention, not surprisingly, probably to IP2, um, the, and it, with particular focus on um, the issues that, that are highlighted at the beginning of the, the memo that could come up that have concerned to the city in this session, that this is the second, the second year of the session, so things have to start over. Bills will have to be introduced anew, but that could be, a real, uh, could, could be introduced to the next session and could be of real concern to the city, um, so sort of Take a look at take a look at that and um, and and think about it as we as we move forward with some of our priorities. I wanted to just bring up um, our ag pending agenda, tentative meeting agendas. One, uh, our next July is going to be a unique month where we're just going to have one meeting uh, for the work session and our formal meeting on Ju July twelfth. But I. On Monday, June, July 18th, we're going to have our joint entities meeting. And so we probably should determine any topics that we want to add, if should there be any, today, because that agenda will more than likely be posted by the time we get to our next meeting. The guideline was not able to present last time. I would hope that, that they could they could present in July so that we could get a better sense of how things are going there. Well, you have Guy Link and you also have um, Better Together 2030. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just, you know, pass that along, not to say that they both, but just as opportunities for some type of a... Um, brief report. Yeah, brief report. Any other ideas? All right, anything else from uh, June 9th, IP? June 16th, information packet. All right, USG, we saw them earlier today, but they are no longer with us, so thanks for coming and being a part. Um, any council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees? Hearing none, maybe. I apologize. I was trying to get my bearings. Um, did we, we have not discussed, uh, I think I think it was actually IP4 for June 16th. It's the ARPA nonprofit operating memo. So we did. We did. Yeah. We, we quickly. I've been here too long. No, you're fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. About two minutes yes. before the formal meeting. Yes, it was really quick. <laughs> it was also yeah. very, it was very, very quick. quick. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. It might be raining. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. It sounds like it, yeah. Like it, yeah.